Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining our session. My name is Maria Garcia Puyol, and I'm a software engineer on the Android Location and Context team. And I'm also one of the co-founders of the Android Emergency Location Service, which helps find wireless emergency callers faster. Now, by a show of hands, who in the audience, like me, has ever dialed 911 or any other emergency number with their smartphone? Oh, wow, so I can see a few. Let me share my story of the one time I dialed 911, which is one of the reasons why we started this project in the first place. In 2014, right after I had just joined Google, I bought my first car. And this is me all happy on that night. About 10 minutes after leaving the dealership, I encounter one of the scariest moments of my life. Suddenly, out of the blue, out of nowhere, there was a woman standing in the middle of the highway. I had to very quickly swerve to avoid hitting her, and luckily, I didn't. Immediately after, I took my phone and dialed 911, the emergency number in the United States. And after explaining what I had just witnessed, the first question they asked me was, where's your emergency? And they ask you this because to be able to send you help right away, they need to know your precise location. But today, over 80% of emergency calls are dialed with smartphones. And contrary to public belief, first responders may have a really hard time locating you. This is because they rely on very inaccurate location information, as my colleague Sunil will explain in a moment. Now, back to my story, I was new to the area. I had just moved to the Bay Area to work at Google, and I didn't know where I was. Everything that I was able to say was, I'm driving on some highway in Mountain View. Luckily for us, other 911 callers had reported the lady on the road, and they were able to dispatch help. But finding emergency callers may not be as easy in many other situations. The irony about this is that we rely on very accurate location information for pretty much everything in our lives. Today, you can get a pizza delivered to your door from a nearby restaurant. You can upload a picture with the right precise location on social media. And you can even get a date around you. But somehow, that accurate location that you see on Google Maps said, get cannot be shared with first responders so that they can find you during an emergency. So even though you see the blue dot that you're so used to and that you rely on for pretty much everything nowadays, a first responders may not be able to say where you're calling from in a big city. I have just joined the Android location team so some colleagues and I sat down and wondered if there was something we could do to help fix this. It boiled down to one single question. What if your mobile phone could send its precise location to first responders automatically? By precise location, again, I mean that accurate blue dot that you see on Google Maps. We got very excited about this possibility. And a small team of us started to work on this as a 20% project. So we spent 20% of our time, roughly one day a week at Google, working on the first prototype. And we focused on three basic founding principles. The first of them was that we wanted to make it automatically available everywhere. So we decided to ship the Android Emergency Location Service as part of Google Play Services, which is available on almost every Android device out there and is updated regularly. And that way, users don't need to download an emergency app. You just need to download the emergency number normally. We wanted to protect the user's privacy. And so the location is computed on the device, on your mobile phone, and sent directly from your phone to first responders, and only during emergencies. And our main goal was to improve the state of emergency services around the world and help save lives by providing more accurate, but also faster locations. The project became the Android Emergency Location Service, or ELS, and it started to get deployed in some countries in 2016, just two years later. Let me share with you one of the most incredible examples of how this technology is, is helping save lives today. It took place in Austria last year.
erhalten, dass ein Bahrgleiter abgestürzt ist. Ohne weitere Angaben wäre es ein stundenlanger Aufwand gewesen, diese Person zu suchen. Ich bin fast täglich mit Situationen konfrontiert, wo man Leute sucht. Seien es können Leute sein, die nicht auffindbar sind. Und wenn man keine Koordinaten hat, die dann zu finden, ist unmöglich und eigentlich nur auf einen Zufall oft zurückzuführen. Sekunden mit dieser neuen Technologie die Position von Andy bekommen. it over to my colleague Sunil, who's going to explain what the state of emergency location was when we started the project and why it would have been very hard to find the protagonist of our video. Thanks, Maria. So I'm Sunil. I'm the tech lead for ELS, and it's great to be here with all you guys today. Now, we've all seen the Hollywood movies or even TV shows where as soon as there's a problem, we can see a call taker with a high-tech screen tracking the caller's location down to the exact room they're in. The reality, not quite as glamorous, unfortunately. So how is it possible that Google Maps can know exactly where you are, but a 911 call may not? So we're going to start with a quick, non-comprehensive overview of how the 911 system actually works in the United States and what can go wrong along the way. So E911, or Enhanced 911, is a system in use in most of the US. Now, Enhanced 911 specifically refers to the ability to get location data alongside a call. In the US, 911 didn't exist until the late 60s. And the vast majority of what is now called the E911 system was developed in the 70s, when the only type of phone was a landline. E911 was, of course, a huge advancement at the time. Before that, there was just a call. There was no location information whatsoever. Now, some quick pieces of trivia. That red phone you see up there is the actual phone that the first 911 call was placed on. And below that, a real picture of one of the first call centers ever built. Pretty high tech for the time, right? All right, so this system was designed in the 70s, but it hasn't really changed that much since then. And even today, if you visit a 911 call center, much of the data, even though it might be presented on modern LCD screens, is likely delivered via serial cables. Let's take a look at how this aging system works behind the scenes in order to get location. The first thing that we want to know about is called the Alley, or the Automatic Location Information Database. The Alley is essentially just a big lookup table. You get phone numbers in one end, street addresses out the other. This makes sense with landline phones. Your kitchen landline phone is not going to be changing street addresses very often. But as mobile phones came around, the Alley had to be retrofitted. Support for latitude and longitude coordinates was added. Carriers had to be able to push cell or GPS location into this database. So if we take a look at this real alley record on the left, there's a couple things to notice. First of all, this is a recent record. This is from 2018. Things still work just like this today. The maximum record size here is 512 bytes. That's all the information we have to work with here. And in many call centers, those 512 bytes are delivered over a 1,200 BPS serial link. Now, to do the math quickly, that means it takes 4.2 seconds just to download this tiny amount of information and get that in front of a call taker. Now, some other things to look at. First of all, we have the address. You can see here this is a call 87 Terrace Street in Roxbury, Massachusetts. We also have some latitude and longitude information. Kind of also buried in there is more accuracy and confidence information that goes with that. Now, I was curious about this address, so I decided to take a look at this on Google Street View. Here's what we turn up. This is a cell phone tower. The real call was pinging off this cell phone tower, but I bet that whoever was calling was not located anywhere near this address and not anywhere near these latitude and longitude coordinates. 
So that's one problem with the E91 system. But there's another problem that better location could help solve, and that is call routing. Now, in the US, there are 6,000 call centers that handle emergency calls uh, alone. And whenever you call 911, a decision has to be made which call center is going to answer that call. Usually, this is done based on the cell tower you're connected to. It's pretty straightforward, usually works, but there can be problems. Cell towers often overlap their range substantially. The jurisdictions that they serve can overlap substantially. All of these complications mean that calls can easily go to the wrong place. And when that happens, the answering call center has to manually transfer the call to the right place. And that incorrect routing eats precious time out of every emergency call. To give you a quick example, it used to be the case that here in California, any emergency calls near highways were routed to the California Highway Patrol even if the call had nothing to do with the highway. And the CHP call center was responsible for triaging that call and then redirecting it to local agencies as appropriate. Now, one study in Sacramento found that this led to an average delay of almost 60 seconds just to transfer that call from the CHP to the Sacramento Police Department. Now, a 60-second delay on every emergency call, that really starts to add up. So if ELS is able to deliver highly accurate location before the call starts, or even in the first couple seconds of the call, then we can route it to the right place immediately instead of routing it simply based on the cell tower. So at this point, we've covered some background on E911 in the US, but we haven't really talked about the rest of the world. Historically, there have only been four countries that mandate GPS as part of their emergency systems, and that have E911 systems similar to the US. As you can see on the map, Canada, the United States, South Korea, and Japan. For much of the rest of the world, emergency location is broken. It either doesn't exist or is only supported by cell tower location technology, which is notoriously inaccurate. Now, this is the problem we wanted to help fix, and we designed the Android Emergency Location System to provide accurate and quick fused locations to every country, as we saw in the video from Austria earlier. So at this point, we've covered several of the problems that we want to solve. ELS was designed to bridge this gap, providing Android's quick and accurate fused location directly to emergency services as a supplement to existing E911 location and to be integrated with next generation 911 systems. So let's talk about ELS itself, and let's start with a high level overview of how our service works. We can break this flow down into four discrete steps. First, of course, the user has to call or text 911 or other emergency numbers such as 112 internationally and so forth. As soon as that call is made, we start computing the location on the device. Once we get the location, the next step is to send that directly from the device to emergency partners. And it's direct in that it does not travel through Google servers. It is then the partner's responsibility to send that location onto the call center and to make sure that it gets in front of the call taker who can use that location on their call. So the left side of this is broadly Google's responsibility, and the right side is broadly our partner's responsibility. Which brings us to the next point. What exactly is a partner? So generally, we work with three types of partners. There are government agencies, there are carriers and operators, and third-party emergency services companies. So with over 6,000 call centers in the US alone, we rely on our partners and their public safety expertise to get this location delivered exactly where it needs to go. So there's the overall flow. How do we configure and control this? Well, Google administers this on behalf of our partners. And we have an incredibly flexible configuration system that supports all kinds of things. I'll touch on just a couple. Uh, we support arbitrary geographic polygons. This lets us control our activations at a county level or a state level rather than just at the country level. Uh, it lets us touch on you know, all sorts of different jurisdictions. We can use the country code and network code from cell towers to help base our logic based on the country and carrier that this call is coming from. And of course, we support location updates for the entire duration of the emergency call instead of just a single update. So somebody made a 911 call. We get the location. Now we need to send it. How do we do that? At the moment, we use two methods, either an HTTPS message or SMS message. We're going to examine both, but let's start by examining the SMS message in a little more detail. Now, when we first started thinking about ELS, it happened that British Telecom in the UK had proposed a new standard for location over SMS messages. This was called the Advanced Mobile Location Format, or AML. 
we adopted AML, and it's now common everywhere in Europe. There was one other thing we had to think of. We originally started experimenting using normal text messages, the kind you might send to your friend every day. But there's one problem. There's no way to keep this from being exposed in the user's outbox. And this presents a privacy concern. Now, if you've ever called 911 from your Android device, and it sounds like a lot of you had to, uh, you may have noticed that that 911 call does not show up in your call log. There's a good reason for this. Uh, in a lot of cases, such as domestic violence situations, it's actually very important that there is no evidence on the phone that somebody has had to contact emergency services that the user's privacy is preserved. So instead, we switched to data SMS. This is simply a subset of the normal SMS standard that allows for binary payloads, but more importantly, does not show up in the user's outbox and helps us preserve the user's privacy. A couple other things I want to mention. SMS generally functions better in lower signal coverage. It doesn't require a data connection, of course. This makes it very useful to us in emerging markets. It may require some coordination with carriers, of course. So let's contrast SMS with HTTPS now. The first and most important difference for us is just HTTPS can handle much more information. It's not size limited like an SM SMS is. It's very flexible and, more importantly, extensible. So you can add new information, add new key value pairs to help give uh, our partners more information and uh, you know, help save lives that way. Now, we found that when a high quality data connection is present, HTTPS actually turns out to be more reliable than SMS generally. Of course, this depends on your cell environment, your signal environment, the, the country you're in, a whole bunch of things. But overall, we see HTTPS as the way forward but we're unwilling to live out, leave out incumbent markets. So we encourage our partners to use both options whenever possible. So now that we have a high-level understanding of how we transmit location, the next piece of the puzzle is how we actually figure out where the phone is in the first place. So to tell you a little bit about the Android Fuse location provider, here's Steve. Great. Thanks, Sunil. Hello, everyone. My name's Steve Malkos, and I also helped co-found ELS. I'm super excited to be here with you all today. Now, let's talk about how location is computed, because getting an accurate location is the key to all of this. The faster and more accurate location we could deliver, the more people we can help. Accuracy and speed of location will reduce the emergency response times. Here's a great quote from the US government. The FCC estimates that 10,000 lives could be saved every year uh, for one minute sooner if a user was calling the emergency dispatching center? That's a very powerful statement. One minute sooner having the potential to save 10,000 additional lives every year? It's quite powerful. OK, so what you saw earlier from Sunil was that the existing emergency system today either used a cell-based position or GPS-based position. Let's first focus on cell. Cell tower positions to emergency responders are not considered a location that they could dispatch help to. That's because the emergency operator is seeing the civic address to the nearest cell tower, and that's nowhere near where the actual emergency is, being, is taking place. And cell tower position ranges in the thousands of feet or hundreds of meters. Like in this example, where we see the cell tower position at our office is over 2,000 feet or 600 meters. GPS. Everyone in this room is pretty much aware that GPS works great when we're outdoors in the open sky environment. Like in this example, where we see GPS position fix of about 25 meters or 85 feet. This was taken indoors, and it's not that good of a position. GPS doesn't work that well indoors. This is the true location where we were when we did this example. But when you're outside in a pure open sky environment, GPS is typically around 5 to 6 meters, or 9 to 10 feet. There are many issues with getting GPS into the legacy emergency dispatching system. I'm going to highlight two of those today. The first issue is that when the GPS position is computed, it's actually computed on the carrier's network. It's not the location that's available on your mobile device, which is much more accurate. The second issue is that the carrier is only computing a single GPS position fix, whereas ELS can compute multiple fixes throughout the entire duration of that call. So 
more or less, GPS has you covered for the most part when you're outdoors in an open sky environment. But what about a downtown, dense, deep urban area? Or when you're indoors or deep indoors? That's where we can help with our comprehensive positioning solution, which includes indoor and outdoor locations. We call it the Fuse Location Provider, or FLP. The Fuse Location Provider is comprised of Wi Fi, GPS, and sensors to do sensor fusion、uh, that gets us this very accurate location. And the Fuse Location Provider is available on almost every Android handset in the market today. In this example, the FLP is able to compute a very accurate position indoors. Right here,、uh, we produced a position at about 29 feet or 9 meters. Earlier today, there was a talk on,、uh, at Google I.O. called Seamless and Smooth Location Everywhere with the new Fuse Location Provider. If you didn't get a chance to see it live, watch it on YouTube. OK, a y so this is the flow from the lower hardware to the Fuse Location Provider. It looks something like this there s many different location providers in Android. Let's say, as an app developer, which most of you are in this room, wanted to create an app that only accesses GPS only locations, you could do that by calling the Location Manager APIs in Android. Or let's say you wanted to build an app that only accessed Wi Fi locations or cell based locations, then you could call the NLP or the Network Location Provider. But if you simply wanted to get the best of what Google offers, which uses all the different location providers, Along with the sensors doing sensor fusion, our recommendation is to access the FLP directly. The Fuse location provider fuses all these technologies together in order to derive the best possible location. And that's what we supply to the emergency responders. So the FLP is ubiquitous. It works globally by providing 3D locations in all different types of environments. We're especially proud of launching Altitude. Or 3D location for indoors. So now we provide 3D X, Y, and Z locations, not only for outdoor environments, but also indoors. The FLP is fast. GPS can sometimes take a very long time to get a position fix. The FLP is almost instant on and gives you very quick location updates as you move around. This is important, as we noted earlier, because the sooner help is sent, the better. And the FLP is accurate. According to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, the average American spends 87% of their time indoors. This is including while they sleep as well. So the FLP needs to work, and it needs to work accurately, especially when we need it most while indoors. OK, a y demo time.、Um, as we were planning this demo for Google I.O., we said we wanted to do a demo that people could relate to. So we went to one of the most recognizable places that we could think of. I could hear Sean Connery's voice right now from the movie The Rock. OK, a y let me try this on you. Welcome to The Rock, <laughs> or otherwise known as Alcatraz Island. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But Alcatraz has its own set of challenges. It has lots of metal, super thick concrete walls, and tiny, tiny windows. This is not conducive for good GPS or Wi Fi signaling conditions when computing our fuse location provider positions. But we said, we like challenges. Let's see how well we'll do. So we worked with the San Francisco Emergency Dispatching Center, who allowed us to place real calls into their center. What this demo will show us is the voice from the call taker will be receiving locations nowhere near the actual emergency. Where that's taking place. But I'd like you to pay attention to how quickly the, lo the location shows up on the phone and how quickly the location shows up on the laptop with the red blinking di、uh, dot. That's a very accurate update from ELS even before the call is connected. Let's play the clip. Hi, this is a test call from Google. I was reaching out to see if I can get the address on your screen.、Uh, hold on. 610 Old Bay. 
Can you repeat that one more time? 610 Old Mason. Perfect. Can I also get the latitude and longitude? Latitude 37.8043 A longitude of negative 122.451328. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. What we saw from the legacy emergency system is unfortunately very common. The dispatch operator noted a latitude and longitude which mapped to the nearest cell tower address. Both these locations were two, over 2.5 miles away from the actual emergency. But what we saw with ELS is the location shown here in red was right on top of the true location. And it, and it could have also been available to the emergency responder even before that call was answered. We're really excited about this service and its, a, its potential to help more and more people globally. Next up, you'll hear from Fiona, who will talk to us about some of the challenges around launching ELS globally. Cool. Thanks, Steve. So Sunil, Steve, and Maria have uh, described how we engineered ELS. And I think we've shown you that ELS provides more accurate location faster than legacy E911 location solutions. But just because you build a better technology does not mean that people are actually going to use it. So I'm going to talk to you about how we launch ELS around the world. And I'm going to focus on the non-technical factors that played a key role in our ability to successfully deploy ELS on a global scale. Now, don't get me wrong. We didn't have all the answers on day one, but we listened to our users. We learned, and we iterated over time. So the first factor to keep in mind is the ecosystem. What are the characteristics of the community of people who will use your product or service? What's the environment in which they operate? What products do they currently use today? With ELS, we focus on two sets of target users, the public safety professional and the end user who will just dial or text an emergency number and expect it to work. So when we looked at the public safety ecosystem, the first thing that jumped out at us is that it is disparate and fragmented. So you have some countries with just a handful of emergency communication centers, and then you have the US with over 6,500. That's more than all the emergency communication centers in Europe. There are some emergency centers that are only staffed by two people, and then there are some that have hundreds or thousands of people taking emergency calls. They all use different IT systems, in the US, we have one emergency number, 911. Thailand has 50. So what that told us was that we have to build ELS to be very flexible and to offer options. And Sunil will walk you through all the different configuration options that we provide. Second thing about public safety is that it is rife with legacy infrastructure. This tends to be expensive, proprietary, have high upgrade costs, and high switching costs. So, what we did was we built ELS so it's standards-based, right? So data SMS adheres to the advanced mobile location specification, and HTTPS is, is HTTPS. The benefit of adhering to standards is that it makes it very easy for your partners to deploy. There's a uniform process to deploy. We also design H, uh, ELS to be fast and easy. So we can turn on a new configuration, we can change configurations, and we can roll that all out in under 24 hours. Finally, we design ELS to be safe. When we decide on a production rollout, we work with our partners to roll ELS out in phases. We usually start at 1%. We let that soak for a few days. Then we increase to 5%, soak some more, and we in increase in increments. And at any point in time, it is really easy to roll back. The second factor to uh, the third factor to keep in mind is public safety is risk averse, right? So lives on the line. The costs of making a mistake are very, very high. So we built ELS, as I said, to be safe and to roll out in phases. Uh, the second factor to keep in mind is your distribution or business model. How do you plan on getting your product into the hands of users? As developers, it's really important for you to find a distribution model that can scale rapidly. For us, we made ELS free, free to partners, free to public safety mostly because it is the right thing to do when we want to keep Android users safe. But free is good. Free promotes adoption, and public safety likes free because they tend to be budget constrained. 
Second key decision we made was to distribute ELS via Google Play services. This gave us a scalable distribution mechanism, and it allowed ELS to be ubiquitously available because Google Play services ships with just about every approved Android phone. The other nice thing about going out with Google Play services is that Google Play services updates uh, over weeks. That meant we could roll out ELS updates quickly and not be tied to an annual OS release cycle. And then finally, we built ELS to be user first. For the user who cares about privacy, we offer an opt-out feature. And as my colleagues have said, we calculate location on the device, and we only activate ELS when an emergency call is made. Now, there were trade-offs in this, right? Because you can offer much more functionality when you do server-side processing. But we made a, a, a decision not to do that. The other thing about ELS is the user doesn't have to take any action. No special hardware required on the phone. No need to download an app. If ELS is deployed in your region, you just dial and text the emergency number, and it will work. For the public safety professional, we design ELS so that ELS can be easily integrated into one of their existing systems. So I don't know if you've ever seen an emergency call taker, but they are juggling about five different screens on their desk. And the last thing we want to do is force them to have a sixth screen in order to get ELS location data. So one of our best practice recommendations to partners is integrate ELS location data into one of the existing systems currently used at the Emergency Communication Center, usually their mapping system or their computer-aided dispatch system. Finally, ELS is future friendly. We have built it so that it will be easily integrated into next generation public safety systems that are being designed all over the world. This third factor is my personal favorite, regulation. What are the laws pertaining to your product and service? Who makes those laws? And how explicit is the language? So as you might expect, there is a lot of regulation surrounding public safety. It's a mission critical service, and governments want to keep people safe. And for ELS, there's an additional implication for us. Because we, transfer, because we transmit location during an emergency call, there are privacy implications as well. So when we look at regulation, the first thing we notice is that laws are lagging. Regulators simply cannot keep pace with technology. So we position ELS as a supplemental service. It's not meant to replace existing emergency location solutions. It's meant to augment it and provide the 911 or emergency call taker with another tool in their toolkit. Second thing about laws is, believe it or not, they can be ambiguous, especially laws that pertain to privacy with respect to emerging new technologies. So when we looked at some countries, we found that you know, there were no explicit, explicit laws saying that you cannot transmit location during an emergency, but there were no laws that explicitly said you can as well. So this is gray area, and we chose to exercise due diligence and caution, and we decided to calculate location on the device so they, and then transmit it directly to our partners so that no personally identifiable information is stored on Google servers. Finally, laws are complex. There are different regulatory frameworks and privacy laws in each country. Uh, these laws, believe it or not, can be sometimes contradictory, often overlapping, and in the case of ELS, generally multi-jurisdictional. Because you make an emergency call over the telecommunications network or you send an emergency text over the telecommunications network, we had to deal with the Ministry of Telecommunications, we also had to deal with the Ministry of Interior, which is generally responsible for public safety, sometimes the Ministry of Defense, and the Ministry of Health. And then there were also data protection agencies that we had to keep in mind. Last but not least is partnerships. So good partners are bridges. We view our partners as a scaling force multiplier. And this is particularly true in public safety, because public safety tends not to be an early adopter of technology. So we rely on our partners to educate and train public safety, and also to work with them to operationalize ELS location data so it can be useful in the emergency communication center. So what we do is we look for partners that have really high standards in quality assurance, in security, in monitoring, in reporting, and in operational support. This ensures that we have a high quality end-to-end -end deployment of ELS. So how are we doing today? Today, ELS is live in 18 countries, serving a population of 600 plus million users. And we send location for over 1.5 million emergency calls per day. 
One of the nice things about being on the ELS team is learning about how ELS has made a difference in emergencies around the world. So I'd like to share a couple of stories with you. The first one has to do with a medical emergency in Lithuania. Eight-year-old boy calls emergency services. He's found his father unconscious, maybe dead. He doesn't know his home address. He doesn't know the phone number of any of his family members. Now remember, Lithuania public safety does not get location via GPS, only cell. So the call taker is seeing a cell tower location of a whopping 14 kilometers, almost nine miles. In a densely populated neighborhood, that's hundreds if not thousands of houses that you have to search. But thanks to ELS, which pinpointed the exact house where the boy made the call, uh, accuracy radius of six meters, uh, the first responders could be dispatched to render medical help really quickly. And as it turns out, the man was suffering from an epileptic seizure. Second instance is a serious mountain biking accident in Austria. Mountain biker was alone, had a bad accident in a deeply forested area, no landmarks, no addresses. Cell tower location was 900 plus meters, but thanks to ELS, which gave a 12 meter accuracy radius, they could send uh, medical help to the injured biker to take him to the hospital because they could locate him quickly. So I'd like to hand the microphone back to Maria to wrap up. Thanks, Fiona. So now that you've learned more about how the Android Emergency Location Service works, I'd like to close the session with some final thoughts. Thanks to ELS, your Android phone is able to send accurate location in 18 countries during emergencies to first responders. But for us, this is just the beginning. We're working on deploying the Android Emergency Location Service in more countries, because we'd like to help as many people as possible. Also, even though our location accuracy is much better than the existing legacy location systems in emergency services, we're always working on improving location, both indoors and outdoors. And one of our very next challenging goals, and we like challenges, is to provide dispatchable addresses and also floor numbers to first responders so that they can find you when you dial an emergency number even faster. I, for one, am very proud of the impact ELS has had on people's lives. And I'm very happy to know that if I were to dial 911 today because I found a person standing in the middle of the highway, first responders would be able to locate me right away here in Mountain View. This project, of course, wouldn't have been possible with the help of our many partners and collaborators around the world, so we want to give them a special thanks. And also, thank you all very much for coming to Google I.O. and for coming to the session. Please reach out if you have any questions or want to know more. That's all from us. Thanks.